So now officially, Bruchim Abayim. Welcome everyone. Delighted to have you all with us again this uh, this Thursday morning as we continue our study sessions. So it's been a, a bit of a dilemma this morning what what to study. It's called Parshat Shavua Plus, and I always like having a phrase that gives me the greatest latitude possible because that plus can be anything. It means that I have to do something with Parshat Shavua but I have the option to do something that is not necessarily part of Shavua. And it, of course, does not determine or designate how much of each of those components will make up the study. So first thing I'd like to do is do a little bit of study from the Parsha. We're in Parshat Naso, as you all know. Let me just get my Chumash out. Those of you who have a Chumash, it might be best if you have it available, although occasionally, if need be, I'll put something up on the screen. So in Parshat Naso, of course, that's the second parsha of the Midbar. If you happen to have the Eitz Chaim, you'll find that on page 791, if you want to take a look at the, the text, uh, or chapter 4, verse 21, it begins with. That in itself is a, an interesting topic. Why does it start at verse 21 and not verse 1? I think I explained that in a previous occasion, that the, the verses and chapters are not necessarily of, of Jewish construction and initiation. That's something that's a medieval Christian designation. Uh, we go according to parshiot, parshiot, parshat shavua, but also uh, breaks in the text, physical breaks in the text. When you look at a Torah, you find sometimes a paragraph ending, uh, either in, in the middle of the line, or beginning at, at the end of the line, whatever. So the designation of the chapters is not necessarily, as I said, our doing. And it's because this chapter continues the census of one of the clans of the Levites, which was begun in the previous chapter with the general census. You might ask why in our tradition is it separated from the rest of the Levite census? I'll leave that to you to figure out. But what I do want to relate to this morning is something that perhaps might seem a little bit redundant, um, difficult to listen to in shul. And of course, I'm referring to the very, very long list of gifts brought by the various <laughs> tribal chieftains uh, upon the consecration of the Mishkan in the desert. We have this fantastic list of them. Uh, talking about what, how many cows, how many sheep, etc., exactly what was brought by each of the chieftains. And how much was different from what was brought by each of the chieftains? Anyone know? You're, you're using your mute privileges, I see. All right, so let me put something on the screen for you. Hopefully I have it open. Uh, so just give me a moment here. My apologies for the delay on the screen right now for you. If you'd like to follow in the text, you can find it in chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 30 to, thir to 41. So I'm just going to share it for you in a moment. My apologies for the delay again. Okay, so what I've done here, if you can see the screen now, there were gifts brought on every day by the 12 chieftains. So let's say each day of 12 days. So I've only given you two of them. So my question to you is this. Why would the Torah belabor the point of repeating, if you look at the text, and I'll give you a hint already, it's exactly the same. The gifts brought by every one of the chieftains is exactly the same. 
Why would the Torah go to the, pro the, the trouble of repeating all those details 12 times? In a sense, it's very tedious to read. In another sense, it's quite easy to read. It's just a repetition of the same thing 12 times. So when we read it on Shabbat, uh, it's not a challenge to read it, but it's a challenge for the people listening to it because it's repetitive. The, the accents, the, the uh, trope is exactly the same for each of those offerings. So why do you think the Torah would bother to repeat every single gift? Why not just say what was brought and then give a list of the various chieftains. It's not a matter of order because we have the same order in any case, just put them in an order of a list without the repeated details. So anyone want to take a shot at stab at that? Barbara, go ahead. Um, could it be that they um, were trying to equalize, show an equality between all 12 tribes? So they did their order in random to show that nobody was first or second. And in terms of the gifts, nobody was better and nobody was worse. Nobody was uh, different. <laughs> Why couldn't we do that by just saying what the gift is? In any case, we have to list the gifts in order. It's, it says the first day, the second day, we know exactly who brought first. There, there is an order here. So oh, all we do okay. is maintain the order in a list of names and just have the, the gift that everyone brought, the exact same thing. So um, Put it down in writing? What do you mean put it down in writing? Oh, for, for posterity, to show that everybody had um, as... Barbara said it has to be written, so it shows that each tribe gave whatever, and that that will be written in the Torah that each one did it. We, so. we could still do that by just listening to names. We, we would know what everybody brought. Why, why do we have to repeat all those details? We're, we're, we'll still have the same recognition and acknowledgement of the gifts of all 12 chieftains without repeating the same text over and over. So. There, there's some interesting interpretations of this. What I would say is this. It's often what we talk about when we, when we, we try, to, try, to, try to talk about things that are similar in what we do and what we experience. Uh, but in a sense, there's no such thing in reality of 100% duplication when it comes to anything involving human beings. What do I mean? First of all, look at the two paragraphs I've given you on the fourth day and on the fifth day. So first of all, each of those chieftains has a different name. Not only that, but it's on a different day. Who knows what the weather was like on the fourth day and what the weather might have been like on the fifth day? I would say that the weather is going to affect the nature of the gift. I would say further that every one of those chieftains is an individual and every one of those chieftains is going to have a different level or expression of their commitment to this gift beyond the giving of the gift itself they're going to be in different moods different things are going to affect their moods there may be more people attending the first and second days because they're excited about these gifts and on the last days crowds may stop coming they may dwindle uh, as we find on the days of Pesach, the first day, a lot of people show up in shul, the second day, a fair number. Uh, the seventh day, maybe because of Yisker. So people tend to lose enthusiasm over time. And perhaps the later days, there were fewer people there. And that may have affected the way the chieftains felt about their gift. So Michael, isn't something missing here? Just to say, let me just finish, Bernie. Let me just finish, Bernie. The, uh, the animals that they brought, it may be the same species of animal, but each of those animals is different. You may not say, well, what's, what's the difference between one ox and another ox? Well, I would say that every ox, anyone has a pet, dogs, cats, is every dog act the same? Does every dog have the same mood? Uh, does every cat have the same mood? No. So the element of individuality has to be expressed in some way. It's not enough to say that they all brought the same thing because the way they brought it the circumstances under which they brought it, the mood each of them was in on that specific day, the mood the animal may have been in that day, everything affects the nature of that gift. And so every single gift as identical as the articles and items in that gift may have been is different. And therefore, what the Torah is trying to tell us by re repeating this, that don't think just because you have the same responsibility to do something, to bring something, that it's going to be considered in exactly the same way. Everything is going to be different because no two things can ever 
be the same when it comes to human participation, human involvement. There is always going to be something that's a little bit different each time. And the tour wants to stress this to make sure that we appreciate that variation and that difference, even though we all have the same obligation and responsibility, our experiences, and therefore that of those who are receiving the gift is going to be different as well. Bernie, you wanted to suggest yeah. something. Is it the same time of the day as well? We assume it was. It doesn't say anything. We have no details. So I think that's what's missing. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't give that information. Right. Our assumption would be perhaps it was, but we don't know. We don't know. So it's a good point. Yeah. Uh, Michael? Yes. If you read the, the, the text, it, it, it said, I, I didn't see it in the other one, but in the one uh, that uh, one goat for a sin offering and one, and for his sacrifice of well-being. And it doesn't say that in the other mention of the other gifts. So it seems that the well-being is, is something that someone is giving uh, from their heart and with a lot of forethought. That's right. That's, that's the intent. That's the expectation. As we read in Parshat Truma, Everyone whose heart gave willingly, that's right. what we wanted in the, in the initial truma, in the initial uh, gifts offered for the building of the Mishkan in the desert. We were hoping that everyone would give it of their own free will with uh, sincere commitment. Uh, and, that, and that's part of this as well. So that's the, the framework for how we want these people to do it. That's the instruction for how you give a gift. Uh, but as I say, those levels of commitment and free will are going to be different for every individual based on a whole series of circumstances and but, criteria, some of which I, I mentioned before. But, but it still has to be in your heart. You have it, has, to it should to. be. It should be. You Whether have to it is, want to. You have to want to instead of giving it because you're obligated to. So you can't force somebody to give something free willingly. You no. can only encourage them uh, that that be the basis and the rationale for offering something. But we all know that we often give gifts far from free will and far from fully committed uh, to the person to whom we're giving the gift. Often we give those out of an obligation, whether it be a uh, contribution, donation to the synagogue or a birthday gift to a, a, a family <laughs> member we may not be crazy about. So we, we do those things. Uh, and that's part of our reality, and that's and that's fine. Uh, often we say that the the essence of giving a gift is the fact that the gift is given. Uh, whatever one's intent may have been, somebody's going to benefit from that gift. Somebody's going to benefit from that donation, even if it was out of obligation, and even if it was out of resentment. Those are not ideal circumstances, but that's a reality. And I think the Torah is telling us, look. This is what we strive for, but we acknowledge that things are going to be different. Not everybody's going to be in the right mood when they fulfill a responsibility of contributing to their community. But we want to make sure that they sense that obligation at the same time as they're acknowledging the fact that it may not be under the ideal circumstances. Okay, so that's my dedication to this week's Parsha. May I ask one more question? One more question. Uh, three points on this. Uh, is one of the days on a Sabbath? It must have been, because it's 12 days in a row. Yeah. So at least at least one, possibly well, two days would have been on the Shabbat. That's interesting. That is. That's Very really interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah it is. And, and, uh, or we can say, and there may be a commentary, I'm not familiar with one, The it may say the it's giving the ordinal days of giving uh, with the assumption that Shabbat does not count in those. So even if we say it's the ninth day of giving, it may in fact be the tenth day, or let's say the fifth day, it may not be the fifth day, but actually the sixth, because it's the fifth day of giving, but the sixth day in order, because we skip Shabbat. It's a great question, I'll be honest, I haven't explored that, and there may be a commentary that uh, deals with that. Uh, of course, the observance of Shabbat is a little bit differently interpreted uh, 3,000 years ago, as it is today with the massive halakha and restrictions and designations that we have in our lives today. One last comment, John, before I move on. Yeah, I can say three points. One is recognition, two, participation, and three, somebody's counting them to see what they actually gave. So it's a validation that they all gave the same. It's not like you just, you know, 
painted with one brush. They, they, were, they were all validated to give the same thing. Mm -hmm. Good point. It wasn't in a closed box where whoever gave it, uh, they may not have checked and they were hoping that whoever is looking into it will not notice or when they're counting it all, maybe somebody left out one of those oxes or one of the rams or only gave four he goats instead of five. Uh, so it's open and exposed so everyone can see it. That's our assumption. That's a good point. Okay. So let's leave Nassau behind and I'll tell you why. I want to read you something that I came across uh, yesterday. Jewish theological seminary community is horrified and saddened by the murder of George Floyd, Ahmoud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and so many others who have come before. This is a devastating and dangerous moment in our country, the history of which is so stained by racial injustice. This injustice has been on dramatic public display. From the disproportionate rate of COVID-19 deaths to the pervasive racism in many areas of public life. We believe that every person must, an institution must assume responsibility to create a more equitable and just society. Jewish tradition forbids us to remain silent in the face of racial justice. Do not, do not stand idly by while your neighbor's blood is shed from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16. We know that these three recent murders and so many others have caused acute pain in the black community in the black Jewish community and among many in our broader American society. We must acknowledge this pain and respond in every way we can. We call on each member of the JTS community and of which we are part in Canada and the entire Jewish community to do all in their power to respond to this moment of crisis by taking action to build a more just world. We can lift our voices, train our students and work in partnership with alumni, lay leaders and our friends and family in the black community. We commit to participating in, hosting, and facilitating the difficult conversations that will be the necessary first steps in beginning to repair the brokenness of our society. The moral voice of JTS must and will be heard loudly at this moment of national crisis. This is core to who we are as a community and as a Jewish institution. Our political leaders must act with similar resolve to ease suffering, heal wounds, and promote the cause of justice. <clears throat> Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel reminded us pointedly that morally speaking, there is no limit to the concern one must feel for the suffering of human beings, that indifference to evil is worse than evil itself, that in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. So I felt unable to disregard what's going on in the States, but I'm not here to try to look at some kind of social action project. I want to take a little bit of time and try to consider uh, how, we, how we can relate to this. I'll mention at the last paragraph, a quote about Heschel, uh, that indifference to evil is worse than evil itself, is rather expressed by the decision of the uh, courts or the, the police to charge the other three officers who were there at the time. Initially, there was only a charge being brought against the one who had his knee on the neck of, of George Floyd, but now the other three are being charged with being accomplices to that crime. And that reflects, in a sense, I would say Jewish and, and human standards of justice and responsibility. And I think it's a, if I can use the term, a wonderful acknowledgement of what our role in the words of Heschel is in terms of, of stemming racism, hatred, and, and behavior and action that is against our most important values. So I think that that statement by the police yesterday to charge the three officers who stood by and did nothing uh, expresses what we all feel about responsibility when something like that is taking place. So I think Heschel perhaps has that the best expression of what, how we should be re relating to these kinds of things. Uh, but I think we need to have in our own way, a way of looking at and having some kind of plan and addressing a world that has strayed very far from where we might have thought that advanced technology and global accessibility might have led us. I think we should be alarmed by what's going on in the US, but more importantly, we need to look in our own homes and backyards and not just that of our neighbors. So 
what are we doing? And we've mentioned this in other classes. We had a session a few months ago on social responsibility, and we looked at Jewish texts and sources throughout history that demanded of us, leading up to, of course, Heschel and beyond, what is our responsibility uh, in terms of what's going on in society? So what are we doing? And I ask this rhetorically, what are we doing about the homeless in Toronto? And if we're talking about police actions, what are our relationship, relationships with the urban indigenous community? Any of you ever heard of Neil Stonechild? Starlight Tours? Let me read something to you. Examples of the sometimes intense hostility displayed by police and the justice system towards both indigenous men and women have become well known in some Western cities. One of the most notorious cases was the murder of Neil Stonechild and the Stonechild inquiry into the so-called so -called Starlight Tours, a practice by which police officers would transport native men to the edge of the city, remove their jackets and shoes, and direct them to cool off or walk home in the middle of winter. Neil Stonechild's frozen body was found on the outskirts of Saskatoon in November of 1990. He was last seen alive in police custody. After 10 years with no resolve for his family about the circumstances of his death, three other young Indigenous men were found dead in the same area, and one Indigenous man, Daryl Knight, managed to make it to safety from the freezing temperatures. So, you know, we talk about the American police, we have our own challenges here. What about our interaction and concern for the Muslim community? Waving a flag for Black Lives Matter can only be meaningful if we are able to see and acknowledge a broader picture. And our experience here in Toronto with its vast diversity uh, offers us more opportunity, often neglected, to look at that. Anyone here familiar with the Sami Yatim story from 2013? Okay, you recall that somebody with a knife, a switchblade, got on a bus, threatened people, supposedly exposed himself, and later on when he was the only one on the bus, without going into all the details, he was shot nine times, nine times by a policeman. And it was later determined that, of course, there was excessive force used. Uh, Constable Frasillo was charged with second-degree murder. Uh, there was a whole bunch of interesting developments in the case. He finally began serving a six-year sentence in December of 2017. And after serving 21 months, uh, began a home parole uh, in January. He was granted full parole on January 17th of 2020, just this past year. So 21 months out of a six-year sentence for excessive force uh, being charged with second-degree murder. There's a case from last week in Toronto. Again, there's a woman uh, who fell from a 24 store building last Wednesday after an encounter with police. And they're trying to determine what the causes were. So we don't know. Uh, she had some mental illness issues, but the fact that she fell from 24 stories after police came into the apartment and removed the relative who was with her at the time we don't know exactly what happened. But the fact that something like this could occur in the presence of police, whoever may be responsible or guilty of some kind of action, indicates that there, there's something wrong uh, with the nature of our uh, views of police, even if it may be few and far between those cases. The fact that those cases are occurring here in Toronto, let alone in Minneapolis and other places in the States, uh, says something that needs to be addressed. Let me share you through the mission statement of the Toronto Police Service from several years ago. We are dedicated to, to delivering police services in partnership with our communities to keep Toronto the best and safest place to be. Core values. Service at our core by respecting and upholding the rights and freedoms of all people in all our interactions, free from bias or stereotype, seeking to understand and help others by making a difference and asking ourselves, have I done all I can do? Do the right thing. By acting professionally, with integrity, and without prejudice, even in the most challenging circumstances, when no one is watching, and on and off duty. 
holding others accountable to the same standards, challenging any inappropriate, inappropriate behavior, and asking ourselves, have I lived up to my word and values? Connect with compassion by treating all people with empathy, respect, equity, and dignity. Going the extra mile to ensure others feel safe, supported, included, engaged, and valued. Standing up for those who cannot stand up for themselves, valuing others' life experiences, and asking ourselves, have I treated others as they would like to be treated? And lastly, reflect and grow. By recognizing that we do not have all the answers, seeking and acting on input and feedback from the communities and our colleagues, acknowledging and learning from our mistakes and successes and asking ourselves, what else can I do to improve? So there is a statement that I think is a very bold and ambitious one. And as with any statement, mission statement, whether it be one that a family is composed, a congregation or a police force, they're going to be people who don't live up to those standards and those instances and perhaps policy that strays from that mission statement needs to be addressed as well. What about Israel? Our support can remain very engaging, meaningful and relevant only if we do not see our support as carte blanche and unconditional. I, I hope I'll have enough time to return to that a little bit later. If not, we'll, we'll, we'll address that in another session. Let's go back to our Parsha for a second. It begins with a census of the Gershonites, one of the clans of the Levites with whom was entrusted the tasks of maintaining the Mishkan and policing it to ensure that unauthorized persons did not encroach upon places of ritual function and holiness where they had no right to be upon punishment of death. So they were, it seems, the first Jewish, if somewhat acronistic term, police people, policemen. But that's not quite true. If you go to Exodus chapter 5, verse 5, you don't have to look it up, I'll just read it to you. What do we read about in Exodus? It says, the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you distract the people from their tasks? Get to your labors. Remember, they tried to say, oh, we're going to take you out of Egypt. We're going to get you out of this place. Don't worry. And Pharaoh obviously is not in favor of that. And Pharaoh continued, the people of the land are already so numerous and you would have them cease from their labors. And now in Hebrew, that same day, Pharaoh charged the taskmasters and translated here foreman, shotrav, hashotrim, today in the modern Hebrew, policemen of the people, saying, you shall no longer provide the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather the straw for themselves. And afterwards, it says, so the taskmasters and foremen, the policemen of the people, went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you any straw. You go out and do it yourself, but there shall be no decrease in whatever you work. Then the people scattered and did what they could. And then it says, The Hanogsim Atsim Lemor, Kalumasechem Dvayom Biyomo Kasher Biyot Hateven. And the taskmasters, Press them saying, you must complete the same work assignment each day as when you had straw. But what does it say about the, about the policemen? And the taskmasters, uh, sorry, um, and the foremen, the policemen of the Israelites, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten. Why, they were asked, did you not complete the prescribed amount of bricks? In others, why didn't you make the Israelites do what they were supposed to? Who are the taskmasters? Who are the shotrim? Who are the nogsim? Who are the shotrim? The nogsim are Egyptians appointed by Pharaoh, appointed by his ministers. The shotrim are Israelite policemen given that task by the Egyptians to enforce Pharaoh's laws. And what does it say about the shotrim? Vayuku shotrei Israel. The policemen, the foremen, were beaten. Why were they beaten? 
because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They didn't sufficiently urge the Israelites to do that, to go to the trouble of gathering the straw, which had previously been given to them. Why would they do that? Because they protected the Israelites. They, even though they'd, be, uh, they'd been appointed by the oppressor, at the risk of their own lives, they decided not to do what they felt was wrong. Does that sound like a familiar situation from more modern history? You know that the Judenreiter, the Jewish councils, political leadership in the various ghettos during the Second World War, also had to appoint Jewish police in order to enforce what the Germans wanted. Um, they were called, So the ghetto police had this task of often, eventually, getting people to board those trains for Auschwitz, for Treblinka, for Majdanek, for Chelno, for wherever those communities were gathered and, and, and uh, murdered. That became a task of the Jewish police as well. And interestingly, there's a, there was an uh, oath taken by the Jewish police in the Vilyampol ghetto and this oath reads, this is in 1940, think about this. I, a member of the Jewish ghetto police in Vilampol, in the presence of the chairman of the Altestenrat and the chief of police, solemnly take upon myself this conscious oath to conscientiously fulfill without conditions all assignments and orders, regardless of time, person, or danger. To fulfill this oath, regardless of personal use, kinship, friendship, or acquaintanceship to hold in strict confidence all secrets and information that I learn in this service. I pledge to dedicate my energies and all my efforts to the welfare of the Jewish community in the ghetto. So that final statement certainly contrasts and contradicts what their other obligations were due to do, no matter what, not to divulge information that might really help them about impending uh, deportations, uh, et cetera, and all sorts of actions. So this idea of Jewish policemen, Israelite policemen, is something that is not new. And the fact that we have to deal or had to deal in the past 3,200 years ago in Egypt and 75 years ago in Eastern Europe, we faced situations where we had to decide what was right despite policy, despite orders. Now, it's a far different situation when we consider the racism that uh, certain police individuals are accused, whether in Canada, the United States, or elsewhere, but dilemmas that police face and situations that they face in terms of performing their duty according to policy in one direction or another are something that uh, Jews may have been familiar with, as I said, as long ago as in Egypt. And it's interesting that the Shotre Israel in Egypt, the fact that they decided not to do as they were bid to do, uh, one of the interpretations later says that they were given the privilege of serving in the Sanhedrin. When it talks about uh, those who were chosen to be in the Sanhedrin, it was the descendants of those uh, foremen, those policemen in Egypt, who, through their own courage and bravery, decided not to do the task of the oppressor. So a fascinating idea of how... Uh, police, policing has been dealt with in our past as well. Um, let's go to another example. Where do we read about Shotrim in the Torah other than this, where we talk about a more positive uh, role of Shotrim, not chosen by oppressors, but chosen by our own leadership? Which parsha? Oh boy. <laughs> shoftrim, shoftim, ve shoftrim, titen lecha bechol sharecha. So in the parsha shoftim in uh, Deuteronomy, we read about the fact that we are supposed to appoint, as it's often translated in English, magistrates and officials for your tribes in all the settlements that the Lord is giving you, and they shall govern the people with due justice. Now, 
It says afterwards, lo tate mishpat, lo takir panim, velo tikach shochad, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. You shall not judge unfairly, you shall know partiality. Justice, justice shall you pursue, that you may thrive and occupy the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, why would it talk about all these aspects of justice when it's talking about policemen as opposed to judges? You might assume that the judges have that responsibility of dealing in justice and fairness with the people that come before their courts. Why are the police included in that? So let me share some commentaries for you from later on in the medieval period and perhaps the modern period that relates to this idea of shotrim in our tradition. It says in Midrash Tanchuma, an early medieval commentary, that the Bible does not define the role of these shotrim, leaving it to later Jewish sages. It says they are magistrates who carry out legal sentences determined by the court, or perhaps they're inspectors charged with going from store to store to check the scales and the measures and to set the prices. In other words, in order to make sure that justice prevails in business and other places. And that's a quote from uh, uh, the Rambam, from Maimonides in his Mishnah Torah. Furthermore, it says to govern, the Shoftim and Shoftim must govern all of the people equally and not show favor to some. This is by a commentary said, uh, called Kli Yakar. And interestingly as well, the Shotrim were originally appointed from the Levites. You recall that the Levites, and we talked about this uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, we said the Levites had replaced the firstborn with the very important duties of setting up and maintaining the Mishkan, and of course, later on through the leadership of the priests with the temple in Jerusalem. Why were the Levites chosen? Because they had acted appropriately uh, when social action and responsibility was necessary during the uh, event of the golden calf. So if they merited that privilege, then perhaps they merited also this ability based on their behavior of being the judges of being the magistrates, of being the policemen uh, to make sure that the, the law is maintained. But it was eventually taken from them. And why is that? Because they were members of an elite class. And it's possible that the elite class couldn't understand the experience of the majority and therefore couldn't be charged with safeguarding them, meaning the Levites couldn't understand what the issues of the common tribes were, of the common person. They had this privileged task, and how would they understand what the common person would be facing? They lived in a, in a world, in a place of their own surrounding the Mishkan. They weren't out on the outskirts of the camp in the desert, and certainly they had certain privileges uh, and responsibilities during the time of the temple in Jerusalem as well. So they could no longer uh, refer and really acknowledge what the people needed. This is a commentary by the Natsiv in something called Hachev Davar. So while we shouldn't exclude any group from being included in police work, we have to make sure that those who serve in a police force reflect the communities they serve in order to be able to act appropriately and righteously. And a lot of emphasis on police work today talks about choosing people from different communities, making sure that various minorities are represented on the police force. Uh, not only that, but involving community officers. And this just isn't just in Canada or the United States. This is in other places in Europe and as well in Israel, where there are people who work in the community, who are in contact with members of that community, uh, whether they belong to that community or not, in order to understand what the needs of that community are, rather than bringing in people to enforce the law who have no connection whatsoever and who may have some antagonism on whatever basis for the community in which they've been placed or in which they serve. So these are all values that have been discussed in Jewish tradition uh, from the ancient period through the medieval period and today. And I'm reading this collection of commentaries uh, by somebody, uh, somebody by the name of Vanita Gupta, who is head of the Justice Department's Civil Rights D Division. 
Uh, she was given the task of investigating the Baltimore City Police Department. Um, and she did a, a bunch of research. And then this article by Jill Jacobs looks at that report and tries to see that some of the problems facing police forces in the United States could very well be answered by referral to some of the Jewish values and interpretations of what policing means. What are the responsibilities? What are the ethical responsibilities, uh, the moral obligations that police have before they serve in various communities? I just want to take a minute and refer to some other examples of Jewish policing. Anyone here of the Jewish settlement police? a police force that served in Palestine during the British mandate. Jewish police people who served together with Arab police uh, in order to uh, do the work of the British in trying to maintain peace and order. Uh, so there are many interesting stories about that Jewish police force, but the, the interesting thing is that perhaps about 15,000 Jewish men served in that police force and about 14,000 of those eventually served in the Haganah, in what became the Israeli army. Uh, and so by 1945, the training that they had received in the British army as police officers, they were able to utilize that training and skills in order to be able to defend the state of Israel in, it, in its infancy after declaration of the state in 1948. Um, If we go, if we talk about um, police ethics in general, I came across a fascinating study, a fascinating book by somebody by the name of Steve Passamanic. It's called Police Ethics and the Jewish Tradition, written uh, a number of years ago, I think about uh, 10 years ago. And I'll just read you a very short paragraph from the review. It says, police ethics and the Jewish tradition begins with the concept of law enforcement officers as shomrim, the guardians and moral agents of a civilized society, and the ethical responsibility that this entails. The author, who happens to be a rabbi, a reserve deputy sheriff, and a police chaplain, draws upon Jewish philosophy and religious tradition to illuminate the ways in which these suffuse the principles and practices of ethical law enforcement. And one of the things he brings up, uh, for example, from the Talmud, it says, with the crafty, one may be crafty. Meaning sometimes certain tactics and strategies are legitimate in order to deal with elements of the population which may be using that. Does it mean, does it, is it saying the ends justify the means? No, it's saying that sometimes you have to use certain means that are appropriate in certain times. Uh, you may also say, well, does that mean that certain acts such as torture are legitimate if you need information in order to prevent a terrorist bombing? You know, that, that, that's a question that uh, society has been dealing with for, for quite a few years. Um, but the fact is that there is instruction and direction from Jewish sources and texts that gives us a better understanding of what our responsibilities are as, the, uh, um, as those who enforce the law and who have to deal with crimes. And I come back to the point before where we talked about shoftim v'chotrim, why the emphasis on judging is handed over to shotrim. Because as one of the commentators says, when you are a police officer, and you come to a scene where something is going on or has gone on, you have to make a judgment. You have to decide, you have to ask yourself questions. Is a crime being committed? Is someone in danger here? You in fact have to make certain judgments just as a judge does in court, but on a much uh, more timely and spontaneous basis. It means you have to have an understanding of law. You have to have an understanding of what ethical and moral obligations and responsibilities are because you are in a position to determine what's going to happen in a certain situation based on your judgment. So when we talk about the responsibilities given to shoftim and shotrim, when it says tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, lo takir panim, lo tikach shochad, you can't take bribery, etc., you as a police officer in all those instances 
just as a judge in his or her court, you have to abide by all those restrictions and obligations. You can't take bribery on the scene. Uh, you can't judge by bias. You have to decide and judge the circumstances in as fair and open-minded and ethical way as you possibly can. So a police person, a police officer, has similar responsibilities that a judge does in his or her court, and I would say even greater challenges because they have to make a very timely decision as, uh, as opposed to having time to deliberate either in court itself with the advice of experts who may be brought in or having the luxury of taking time, whether it be a day, a week, or a month, to further explore and investigate and then decide what the right circumstances would be and what the right decision would be. So if anything, a police officer has even greater responsibility to act in an appropriate manner. Are all our police officers in democratic countries, I won't even talk about non-democratic countries, are they trained appropriately? Do they have those skills? Are they given the, indication, the education to be able to make those appropriate decisions? Uh, do they have the community minority sensitivity training in order to make those at the moment decisions to judge circumstances in an appropriate manner? I'll leave that for you to answer, but it's uh, probably more of a challenge than we often think about. We expect of our police officers to do what's right. <laughs> that is far from a simple thing. And if any of us were in those situations, we would probably understand much better what the challenge is. Um, and now I'll come to one, uh, two, two last things. Uh, I mentioned before Shomrim, that one of the commentators says that uh, those who serve as police, in the Jewish police, need to be considered as Shomrim, uh, those who uh, protect and guard others. So you may be familiar, in Brooklyn, there's a private Jewish patrol called the Shomrim, uh, organized by the ultra-Orthodox community to try to maintain order in the community and do what they can to maintain good relations between the non-Jewish community, often the black community in which they live, or with uh, secular people who don't have an appreciation perhaps for uh, the religiosity and piety of the ultra-Orthodox community. So when they perform their tasks, and again, this is something I suggest you do a little research on, are they basing their behavior, their actions on a study of Jewish sources on an understanding of the responsibility, ethical and moral and educational, that people who serve as police judges have in those capacities. Unfortunately, there are instances where their abuse of power led to the injury to certain members of the black community. Um, and there have been a, a number of cases where they were charged with brutality and excessive violence in trying to defend members of their community. Granted, there have been instances where children in their community have been beaten, kidnapped, murdered. Unfortunately, it goes both sides, but we can't say because others don't perform their tasks properly that we who have taken on the responsibility as shomrim, as shotrim, as instantaneous, instantaneous judges in certain circumstances, haven't done the proper preparation and haven't uh, considered our responsibilities in those circumstances. So that's one example. Now I'm going to go back to Israel just for a few minutes. When we talk about uh, the state of Israel and the police force there, the police force there is kind of interesting because unlike in North America where we have local urban police forces and we have national police forces, we have the RCMP, formerly the Northwest Mounted Police. Everyone in Israel serves in a national police force. There is no Beersheba police force. There's a branch of the national police force in Beersheba, but it's all a national police force with a specific and universal policy for dealing with situations. Uh, it's based in a sense, in terms of its hierarchy and bureaucracy on the army. The head of the police is like the head of the army in terms of his ranking, etc. And we know of, very, of, of numerous instances where there have also been uh, what you might call police brutality in Israel. We know that, unfortunately, members of the IDF 
often have to serve in policing functions as well in the West Bank, things for which they're not trained. It's not their job to serve as police. They're supposed to be uh, soldiers, and soldiers don't have the same responsibility or the training to serve as police. So we're aware, and I'm not going to go into the many instances uh, of sometimes the inappropriate action that Israeli police or soldiers serving as in the function of police have taken. I would say that the behavior of the army and the police uh, by far is, is a very positive one, is a, a moral one, an ethical one, but there are instances uh, that we hear about and read about. And when I said before, our support for Israel uh, needn't be unconditional. It means that we have to be willing, as we're willing to criticize our own police force here in Toronto, as we're more than willing to criticize American police forces, uh, we need to be able to criticize and judge and view occasionally, when inappropriate, uh, those actions taken by Israeli police forces, uh, individuals, I should say. Uh, and why do I speak about that? Because there was recently a report put out by the RAND Corporation who was invited by the Israeli police, as well as some other government agencies, to analyze what the police do today, the Israeli police, and come up with some kind of understanding what their responsibilities are in the 21st century. This was done about, uh, I think, seven or eight years ago. And they talked about all the things that we've kind of been discussing, at least briefly, the idea of how we relate to minorities, and that's certainly a relevant issue in Israel in dealing with Palestinian population, in dealing with ultra-Orthodox population, which are often considered a minority in some of the relationships between them and the state. And there are other instances as well, how we deal with women's issues as well. Uh, and, and that can be considered uh, a, a troubling, occasionally troubling a challenge for policing in Israel as well. Uh, so I would, I'll direct you at some point, if you're interested, to this RAND Corporation uh, report. It's fascinating, some of the things they bring up. Two of the things that we mentioned I, as well, how we deal with minorities and how we try to include minorities in the police force and how we make sure we try to understand more about the communities. So on paper, as with the Toronto Police Force, there is a mission statement and a goal to try to do that as something that might benefit uh, the policing action, but it's not always something that is, is as effective as we would like. And lastly, with regards to Israel, I would share with you the fact that I had the opportunity, whether I call it the privilege, the honor, to serve in the civil guard, what we call in Israel the Mishmar Ezrahi, where we would patrol at night. Uh, and if there were any disturbances that need to be dealt with, uh, we uh, we'd been trained, we were armed in order to deal with any such disturbances in whatever community we were assigned. That may have included in a city like Haifa, where I lived at the time, uh, going down to some of the Arab neighborhoods, uh, going to the few ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods, uh, and it meant trying to have a sensitivity for what was going on in those neighborhoods. I'll, I'm happy to say that we didn't encounter, and fortunately the unit I was with was not guilty of any actions which I might consider inappropriate, but the fact remains that those things do occur occasionally. And as I've shared with some of you in the past, I also served in the military police when I was in Israel. That was, that was my military service. And although we had some training as military police, uh, we were soldiers. And what I ended up doing was serving as a guard, which police people tend to do, in, in prisons. In prisons, that were designed for Palestinian uh, Palestinians who had been charged or who hadn't been charged, who had been arrested and held uh, without not always being charged. And if my experience there, if I were able to say that I saw no abuses of power and no inappropriate behavior by other uh, members of the force in which I served, I would be delighted to be able to say that, but that wasn't the case. And you can say, well, you can understand the pressure placed on Israeli uh, police people, uh, military or otherwise, serving in prisons, holding suspected Palestinian terrorists. You can say, well, there's an incredible amount of pressure and fear involved, and therefore action sometimes uh, is something that is expressed by that fear, by anger, especially after incidents, uh, which at the time, as I served, were many in terms of bus bombings and knife stabbings, etc. So we can attribute and rationalize behavior in different police forces 
but that's only an excuse. That's not something that we can use as instruction or direction for the way we relate to police services. And I would hope that in our brief study this morning of some of the connection that we have to police forces here in Canada, specifically in Toronto, as well as our Jewish connection historically and otherwise, uh, that we take a closer look at not so much or only at what police do and don't do according to our expectations, but what are those expectations? Are our expectations of police forces, wherever they may be, realistic? Are they trained appropriately? Uh, do we try to create as members of a community and do we request and demand of our political leadership to create communities and uh, demand an environment that supports proper behavior uh, or are we allowing things to get out of hand because we don't do enough about it? So there are many things that we can do in terms of education, in terms of social action. Uh, I've been very inspired by the people from vastly different communities who have gone out on a limb and attended, despite the lack of social distancing, uh, demonstrations in different places in the United States, here in Toronto and other places, uh, to make a statement about what we need to be doing to deal with some of those underlying issues, racism, hatred, fear, and others. And once we've tried to deal with those, then we can have reasonable expectations of those who try to enforce uh, policies, whether it be the police, the judges, or anyone else. So my suggestion to you, although I said at the beginning we were not going to do that, is to find ways that that you can be involved in making sure that we're creating and maintaining and sustaining an atmosphere where that fear and hatred and racism is mitigated, is lessened, uh, so we don't have the kind of outbreaks that we have, we don't have the kind of incidents that we have, uh, both here in Toronto, uh, the United States is a little bit out of our hands, of course, but it's, it's, our, ob it's our obligation to make sure we understand what we expect as well as uh, what we're going to be doing about it, hopefully encouraging our leadership to take some kind of action. I want to end with something uh, that's part of the Parsha. As you probably know, the priestly blessing is included in this week's Parsha. And when you think of what the priestly blessing is about, just one second. The priestly blessing is something that applies to the entire people of Israel. And we often use it to offer to our children, whether they become b'nei bat mitzvah, mitzvah on Yom Kippur, we offer that blessing. It's a blessing offered to those who perhaps, as children, don't yet share in power, and perhaps whom we haven't yet acknowledged as those who have the same power and authority that we have. So I offer that blessing today that we think about how we can empower not just our children, but all those who feel that they've been marginalized, who don't yet share the kind of authority and privilege that many of us do. And perhaps that might be a way of thinking of, of uh, how we can think about those who are in those situations and what we might be able to do to them. So, may God bless you and protect you. May God show you favor and be gracious unto you. And this, perhaps more than anything, is what we need to be thinking of these days. May God show you kindness and grant you perhaps the greatest of all gifts, that of peace. So I'll just uh, let you know that uh, next week there won't be a class, uh, and we'll continue in a, in a couple of weeks. But I would challenge all of you to take it next week's like, uh, look at next week's Parsha and maybe find something that you can focus on uh, that might be meaningful, particularly for you. And uh, maybe we'll take a moment to, to share those uh, reflections when we meet again in two weeks. So I'll just uh, give you a couple of moments to, if anyone wants to share any comments, and I'll wish you all uh, a more peaceful world and look forward to meeting you again to study. Thank you, Mark. A historical Yashikoa, perspective on, yeah. on uh, policing uh, from uh, a Jewish perspective. Uh, I didn't realize we had such an enlightened view of policing so many years ago. 
Uh, yeah, those, those interpretations date back, as I said, to uh, commentators from medieval periods until the modern period. And uh, uh, as, uh, what's her name? I forget her name. Uh, as the one who wrote that article, <laughs> about how perhaps police forces today might take some instruction from what we have, we have to be aware of it and we need to be willing to share that and, and, and show how seriously we take this idea of policing. Uh, it should be a profession that's regarded with respect and admiration. We have to make sure it's that. So I have a meeting with my clergy colleagues. Uh, so I I'll grant you all a, a wonderful day. Great studying with you. Thank you very much for Thank forcing you. me to uh, explore and research much. and look forward oh to seeing you soon. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Very timely. Have a good day and stay healthy. Stay well. Thanks.